Romans chapter 3. Continue in our study of this important epistle. And we come to the very heart of what is the gospel of God. Beginning in verse 21, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now here we come to the theme of this book, this very important book by, of God, how we can receive the righteousness of God. When Paul says, but now, the word now refers to all that has been said up until this point. He is gathering up the force of the whole argument that he has just been going through. Remember, he has shown that the heathen is lost and guilty before God. He has shown that the moral man is lost and guilty before God. And last, he showed that the religious man is lost and guilty before God. And now he turns to what is the solution. He says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The word, the verb in the original Greek, has been manifested, is in the perfect tense, which means that God's righteousness that is available to man has been manifested in the past with the results it goes on being manifested. And it says that this righteousness from God that's available to us is constantly being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, what Paul is saying and emphasizing here is that the message of the New Testament that came with Jesus Christ is not apart from or in contradiction to the Old Testament. But in, instead of being different, it was actually witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's not a different message. It is something that was constantly witnessed and anticipated by the law and the prophets. So let's look at that more deeply. First of all, the Mosaic law came in three phases. There's the moral law. The first phase, the moral law, all right, that is the moral code. It was summarized in the Ten Commandments. But you know, there are more than 600 specific commandments in the law. And of course, the rabbis recognized this and codified these various commandments and then made volumes of interpretations about what those commandments meant and instructions of how to keep them. In so doing, they missed the whole point of those commandments, usually. But the moral law summarizes the commandments. And the moral law shows us how good we would have to be if we were to earn God's acceptance by our own good deeds. Now, the second phase of the law is the sacrificial and spiritual code. The sacrifices were given at the same time the moral law was given. I was just talking with my daughter Heidi, who goes to the University of Washington in Seattle. And yesterday she told me, she said, Dad, you know, my religion teacher gave me a very low grade on my religion test because when he asked me to compare Judaism with other religions, I brought out the fact that when God gave Israel the law, he anticipated that they could not keep it. And I brought out what, you know, we've talked about many times, that the moment that God gave them the, sacrifice, the 
moral code, he also gave them the, the animal sacrifices, which showed that there had to be a means of forgiveness when they broke the law, which showed that God knew they couldn't keep it without breaking it. And this uh, religious teacher said this is a Christian influence, and therefore he graded it down to a low grade. And so I said, well, send me a copy of your test, and I'll write out something that's going to curl his hair. <laughs> and if it doesn't, I'll go up and remove his hair. <laughs> the Apache in me comes out every once in a while. But you know, I think people who teach religion uh, as history or comparative religion in universities and colleges, I think the first prerequisite is that you be an atheist. And the second is that you don't believe the Bible is the word of God. I mean, you know, you just can't believe that and be in these classes. So when he started out the class, he started out by telling her, well, look, I don't want to get into any interpretation of the Bible. Well, how are you going to teach the Bible if you don't interpret it? But back to the main point. The main point is that God knew that the Israelites could not keep the moral code, and he showed that by immediately providing animal sacrifices and a whole ritual system for the priesthood within the temple worship service and the temple services. And all the sacrifices, the priesthood and their, their orders, the furniture and the tabernacle itself pointed to the fact that God was going to send a Messiah who would fulfill all of these things. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist who was an Old Testament prophet, the last of the Old Testament prophets, summarized the whole meaning of the law when he first, when he saw Jesus and he first understood who he was. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was a summary of the significance of the whole sacrificial system. It was a summary of all that the tabernacle had meant. Now, one of these days soon, if I ever get through writing this book I'm working on, I'm going to have to also teach the book of Hebrews again because the book of Hebrews is a great deep book that teaches how all of these animal sacrifices and the worship system of the tabernacle pointed to Christ. They were all pictures of what he would do for us. Now, when we look at the moral code, I'd like for us to see how the Apostle Paul explained its significance in Galatians chapter 3. Hold your place in Romans and turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Galatians chapter 3, beginning with the 10th verse. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written. Now he is going to quote Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. And his proof that the law could never save is from the law itself. Quoting now from Deuteronomy 27, 26, Paul says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now, there are three things you should get from that quote. First of all, if you're going to come to God by keeping the law, then you, you must realize that you must keep all that is written in the law. All, not just pick and choose some commandments 
and say, I like these, I'll keep these, and leave out the ones you don't like. No, it involves keeping all the commandments. One of the interesting things is that as you read the volumes of rabbinic interpretation of the Ten Commandments and how to keep them, they have volumes on everything except the Tenth Commandment. You know why? The Tenth Commandment is you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. You shall not desire it. You know why there's no writing on that? Because that deals with something on the inside. It deals with the heart and not with actions on the outside. The rabbis dealt with external things that you could refrain from doing. But they did not deal with things that dealt with the heart because religion cannot clean up the heart. Religion can clean up the outside, but not the heart. And so that's one commandment they never gave much attention to. That's why when Jesus came to them in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you've heard it taught by the elders, referring to all of these rabbinic writings and all of the rabbinic teachings. You shall not commit adultery. But I say that if you look after a woman, you've committed adult, look after a woman to lust for her, you've committed adultery already. And he showed that breaking the commandment was something you do in the heart. And so this was always part of God's intention in the law, in giving the law. Now, the second aspect of this verse is that you must actually perform the law. You must actually do it. Now, notice it says that uh, you must, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So you actually have to perform the law, not just learn all about it. And you see, this is what the religious crowd always does. The rabbis did it. We still do it today. Those who say you can be saved by works depend upon learning all about what you're not supposed to do. But there's not a, it's almost like if you know what you're not supposed to do, that somehow absolves you from actually breaking the commandment. And that's why Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount to show that God doesn't just look on the outer appearance at what you do on the outside. In his sight, breaking the law is any desire to do the thing in your heart. So I said, you've heard it taught by those of old, you shall not murder. But I say that if you're angry without cause, you're in danger of being judged for murder. So no one could ever keep the law. God knew it. Now, there's a third aspect in this statement from Deuteronomy 27. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. The word abide means to be continually performing all things written in the book of the law. So you had to live by everything written in the law you had to actually perform it, and you had to actually perform it continually. So Paul quoting from the law itself shows that there was no possibility of anyone ever keeping the law in a way that would make them acceptable to God. They were to live by it, but not as a way of salvation. Now, this is all summed up by the half-brother of Jesus. His name was James, and he wrote a book called the book of James in chapter 2, verse 10, where it says that... Hmm, slipped my mind. James 2, 10. Oh, I, I've got it now. Whosoever keeps the whole law yet offends in one point is guilty of all. That's a summary of Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, which is quoted here. Now, there was also a third phase to the law. 
the social phase, that is the, the laws about separation of those who were sick, of cleansing, and so on. This was a part of the law that shows God provided for his own and cared for his own both in time and eternity. All right, so the law witnessed to the fact that God had a righteousness that he would give to people and the law showed that you would never get it by your own efforts. And that's what it means when it says there's a righteousness of God manifested that is witnessed by the law and the prophets. But it took the prophets to show clearly that the righteousness of God is something that must be given by faith. And that's why it goes on to say here in verse 11 of Galatians 3, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for, now he quotes from Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Habakkuk was one of the prophets. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 says, the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteous man shall live by faith. Now that was taught all through the Old Testament. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Faith was always shown to be the way of salvation. But Habakkuk made it very clear. The righteous man shall live by faith. And so in that sense, the prophets witnessed to the righteousness of God by faith. Verse 12, it says, however, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. And that's a quote from Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. He who practices the law shall live by the law. And that showed that no one, you know, if you start living by the principle of law, trying to earn God's acceptance, what happens is that then God must judge you on the basis of merit. The law is a whole system. If you, try to, if you try to earn God's acceptance by what you do for him, either before you become a Christian or after you become a Christian, then the standard immediately becomes based on merit. And guess what? Your merit must equal the righteousness of a holy God. And so that's why Paul quotes from the Old Testament and he shows that the law was always based on merit. And therefore it could never be of faith because faith is something you give and you do when there is no merit. Faith is something you can do and still not do nothing. To put it in bad grammar, but make the point. Faith is the absence of human merit. That, that is the reason it is the vehicle through which God can give us righteousness. All right, let's turn back to Romans chapter 3. Now, one of the, I want to go through some of the prophets and show that the righteousness of God that makes a, a man el eligible and makes him fit to stand in the presence of a holy God, that this has always been promised and anticipated and that it was a righteousness that was apart from our efforts to be righteous. It's something that had to come as a gift. Now, hold your place and turn with me to about the middle of your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 23. I would quote this, but I want you to read it for yourself. You might want to underline a few things here. Jeremiah chapter 23. Verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as a king 
and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called. What is it? The Lord, whose righteousness? Our righteousness. Now this shows us something right here. Who are we talking about here? Who is this predicting? The Messiah, Jesus. Yes, Yeshua HaMashiach is predicting him. Because it says he will be a son of David and he will be a righteous branch who will come out of the lineage of David. So immediately we know we're talking about the greater son of David who is consistently recognized in the prophets as being the Messiah. He will be a king and he will be a son of David. And it says in his day, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. But the important thing is the name by which the Messiah will be called. This is the name by which he will be called. Yahweh. Or as we say in English, Jehovah. You see that Lord is in all caps. Now, thank God when the English translators translate from Hebrew, they're consistent. Whenever the Hebrew is Yahweh or Jehovah, they translate Lord in all capital letters. So who is being called Jehovah here? The Messiah, the son of David, Yeshua, or Jesus. Now, that just blows the Jehovah Witnesses right out the door, doesn't it? Because they say that Jesus is not Jehovah. Well, this predicts that Jesus would be Jehovah, which shows that the Jehovah Witnesses are not Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the Angel of Light's Witnesses, Satan. They're Witnesses of Satan. By the way, this new film by Pat Matriciano is tremendous. So plan to come for that. It is tremendous and tra plan to bring people to it. It's a powerful film on Jehovah Witnesses. But if you want to talk about something, you know, these Jehovah Witnesses are always coming to the door. Well, show them this. It definitely is predicting that son of David who would be called Jehovah But most important for our consideration here today, Jehovah, our righteousness. Now this shows that the righteousness of God, which is promised to us, is a person. The righteousness of God is not just a legal transaction that is imputed or given to someone. The righteousness of God is a person. And when we get that righteousness, we have to be in union with that person who is that righteousness. And that's exactly what the Bible says takes place when we believe in Jesus Christ. We're put into a living, organic union with him so that his own absolute righteousness becomes our righteousness as a gift. So the prophets did witness to the righteousness of God, didn't they? This is not something that was dreamed up when Jesus came on the scene. The righteousness of God was always anticipated in the Old Testament, and it was realized, too. In Genesis 15, 6, when it says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to his account for righteousness, it meant his faith in God's word was the... That act of faith, that one act of faith was credited to his account as righteousness and it made him acceptable to a holy God. Now turn with me to Psalm 143, verses 1 and 2. It's amazing how many in wonderful things are revealed in the Psalms. A book of, a book of worship, a book of singing, a, a book of songs 
but incredible doctrine is taught in them. Psalm 143, verses 1 and 2. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication. Answer me in thy faithfulness, in thy righteousness. Do you know this is one of the first verses that really began to get to Martin Luther and brought about his conversion when he believed that you could only be righteous by faith? You know why it got to him? Look at here. When David pleaded to the Lord to answer him, he pleaded on the basis of God's righteousness. And Martin Luther said to himself, why would he ever plead with God on the basis of his righteousness? He, it seems to me he should plead on the basis of mercy because it's God's righteousness that condemns us because we're unlike him. And this began to make him think, how could David ever appeal that God would hear him on the basis of God's righteousness? And then the next verse tells us why. And do not enter into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight no man living is righteous. Well, then why did David say, answer me, in your righteousness. This made Martin Luther begin to think, well, since there's no man living righteous, God must give us a righteousness that enables us to approach him on the basis of that righteousness. And that is strange that this would be the verse that would start that revolution that later resulted in the Reformation. But it was this verse. But this shows us that there's no man living that's righteous in himself. No one can ever be good enough for God to accept. But yet we can approach God on the basis of his righteousness, which Abraham showed us can be received by faith. Look at Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there's no deceit. This is used in Romans chapter 4. It's quoted there. But it shows that there is a way that God can deal with man wherein he doesn't even credit to your account iniquity. There is a condition that man can, be, uh, can move into where God can deal with him in pure grace, where his sin is covered, where his transgression is forgiven, where God does not impute to him iniquity, even though he may be in iniquity. And certainly David was in iniquity when this psalm was written and he had confessed it. Look with me at Isaiah 53, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 53 has been called the bad conscience of the synagogues because it's a difficult one to understand if you say that there is no Messiah that needs to die for our sins, and that's what they're saying. This predicted that there would be a Messiah who would come as a man and die for our sins. But look with me at verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he, referring to this servant who would come and take our place and bear our sins, it says he will see it and be satisfied by means, literally, by means of his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Now here it says that the Messiah, this one that God calls the righteous one, his servant, that he would justify men because he would bear their iniquities. In other words, 
he would die for our sins and therefore he would qualify to be able to declare us righteous by his sufferings. So here the whole thing was in the Old Testament. Now turn back to Romans 3 because Paul wants us to realize that the whole salvation that is being spoken of in the New Testament was, was predicted and witnessed by the Old Testament prophets. Indeed, all of those who were true believers in the Old Testament were justified by faith. No one's ever been justified by keeping the law. Now, in verse 22, where it says, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Now here we have the common denominator of all men before God. There's no distinction between men when they approach God. The heathen, the moral man, or the religious man, they all must come to God on one basis, for there's no distinction. And verse 23 says why? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, whether you're a religious person sincerely trying to seek God's acceptance by your good deeds, or whether you're a moral man trying to qualify for God's acceptance because you're, you're always seeking to do the right thing, or whether you're the pagan who's just out there doing whatever it comes naturally, no matter what category you're in, all have sinned and keep coming short, literally, of the perfection of God. The glory of God is his perfection, his righteousness. All have sinned and keep falling short of that. You see, the problem is the standard. Frequently, when I fly over the Rocky Mountains, or when, let's put it even more dramatically, when I fly over the Alps, many times I've been over, over uh, at high altitude over the Alps going over Switzerland. You know, when you fly over those Alps and you look down, they all seem to be about the same height. You know, you can see some that seem to be a little bit higher and so forth, but when you're looking down from 40, 42,000 feet, they all seem to be about the same height. I remember recently flying over the Alps and then circling around and landing in Zurich. Well, when you land in Zurich and then you are on the ground and you look out at those mountains, you can see, well, there are a lot of them that are higher and there's some lower and there's, there's great variance in the height of those mountains. You see, it's all a matter of perspective. And it's the same way when man tries to look at righteousness. As God looks down at man, he sees that some may be a little better than the other, but they're so far below his righteousness that it looks like they're all the same. There's no distinction. When we're down here on the earth and we look at different people, we can see a comparative difference in their standard of righteousness. But when you look at, at God who is in heaven, we're so far below him. There's no distinction. When I first moved to California in 1962, they had a game they used to love to play. It was called Jumping to Catalina. And they used to have to see who could come the closest to jumping to Catalina off the Santa Monica Pier. Well, that reminds me a great deal of how people try to keep the law or how they try to earn God's acceptance. You see, the standard is never going to be how we stack up with each other. Relation that was radically different than anything man could ever dream of. God had to come up with a plan of salvation that would make us qualified to stand in his holy presence 
and would make us as righteous as he is righteous. And the only way God could bring us into that kind of a plan would be to make it given on the basis of a completely non-meritorious system. There could be no human merit in the appropriation of this righteousness that God himself would provide because the minute there would be merit involved, it could not be received because the minute merit is involved, then man has to perform and qualify himself. So that's why we read in verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, faith is without merit. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction, the great common denominator of man, we may not be equal in many things, but we're all equal in one thing. We're all equally guilty before God and fall short of his righteousness. And therefore, God says we can all equally come to him by faith. Now, in verse 24, after it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it says being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful thing to be justified as a gift. And how desperately we need that. When it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, listen to some of the things the Old Testament said about the condition of man. You know, you, you wonder why in the world anyone would ever try to come to God by keeping the law or by any system of human merit. Let me just read you from Deuteronomy chapter 5 what God said when he gave the law to Israel Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 29 verse 28 first and the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke from, to me and the Lord said to me, this, he's referring back to when Israel, uh, Moses read the law to them and Israel very arrogantly said, all of this law we will keep. And Moses had, the Lord had told Moses to tell him, remember how I have brought you on eagle's wings from captivity in Egypt and how I've delivered you from Pharaoh, and how I've brought you through the terrible desert. What was God doing? He was trying to remind them he did all of that as a gift, simply by faith of Moses, mostly. And then he had Moses read the law, and what did they do? They said, all this law we will keep. All right, now look what God says as he refers back to it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all that they have spoken. Then verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. What is God saying here? Oh, that they had a heart to do what they just said they would do. You see, God knew better. I believe that when Moses read the law to them, if they had said to God, Oh, Lord, your law is wonderful, but we can't keep it. Continue to deal with us if you've dealt with us from Egypt until now. God wouldn't have put them under the law. He would have dealt with them by grace through faith. But instead, man always arrogantly thinks that he can do something to earn God's acceptance. Every one of us have to go through law school before we will recognize that we can never be good enough for God to accept. You know what law school is? To try to earn God's acceptance by keeping the law. The harder you try, the more you break it. 
because the law stirs up the old sin nature the more you try to keep it. So it really, the harder you try to live for God by his standards, the more your sin nature rebels and the worse you get. Now you may conceal it on the outside, but in the heart you keep getting worse and worse. Only the Holy Spirit can give us the ability to live for God. And he does that by changing the desires of our heart and giving us power to live by those new desires. It has to be apart from the law. All right, just to quote a few things that God said about the condition of man. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Solomon said this in another way in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. He said, there's not a just man on earth who always does good and never sins. Ecclesiastes 7, 20. That was a thousand years before Christ and Solomon saw it clearly. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, where he says, We are all as unclean things, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy minstrel rags in God's sight. I just gave you what the Hebrew said. That's what it says. Filthy rags, but it's a very specific word in Hebrew. All of our good deeds are as filthy rags in God's sight. So what must our sins be? If even our good deeds are filthy rags, how are we ever going to make it to God? Well, that was the question that Job took up. Now, you know, Job was a contemporary of Abraham. He lived in the general time of Abraham. And this is what Job said in chapter 25, verses 4 and 6. How then can a man be just with God? Now, that's the real question, is it? How can a man be just with God? Or how can he be clean who is born of a woman? If even the moon has no brightness and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man, the maggot, and the son of man, the worm? Job recognized that there's no way to be just with God by any human means. Now, that's why it's so refreshing to turn to Romans 3:24 and to look at it carefully. When it says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now there are four very important words in this verse. And you must understand them to really understand salvation justified, gift, grace, redemption. Those are four powerful words, and you can write a whole book on each one of them. But I won't try to do that this morning. The word justified is the Greek word dikaio which means to declare someone without guilt and legally righteous. Now this is saying that God does that to us as a gift. Now here's what the doctrine of justification was the great error in the Roman Catholic Church. They took the concept of justification and they made it as if it were a process of, of God progressively making us righteous in our conduct. And there are many denominations that call themselves Christian today who still commit that same error. When they talk about justification, they, they mean by that that you progressively make yourself righteous and then if by the end of your life you've made yourself righteous enough, God will accept you. Boy, 
You ever seen the squirrel running on the treadmill? That's what I'm reminded of with people like that. But this word means something that happens all at once, completely. It means to declare someone as righteous as God is righteous at a moment of time. And that moment of time is when he believes that Jesus Christ died for his sins. And justification does not mean to be put in a state where it's just as if you never sinned. Now that's a nice little cliche, but that's not what justification means. It's not just as if you never sinned. That's, that's subtraction. Even if you were put into a state where it was just as if you never sinned, you'd still not be acceptable to God because you'd be a zero. No, it means to put you in a state where it's just as if you always did everything right. Well, that's something very much different, isn't it? To be justified is something that happens at the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then all of the sins that you will ever commit in this life are forgiven, past, present, and future. And you're not just forgiven, as wonderful as that is, but you are immediately declared as righteous as God is righteous. And then he puts you into union with Christ where you become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, and his righteousness is clothed upon you as your righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, For he who knew no sin was made sin for us, in order that we might be made the righteousness of God, where? In Him. So you're not only declared righteous, you're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You're legally declared righteous, and then you're made actually righteous by being given the righteousness of Christ. So it's not a legal fiction, it's something that actually takes place. Now, this is given as a gift. This is the word in Greek, Dorian, D-O-R-E-A-N, Dorian. This is a word that means more than just handing a gift to someone. In fact, it's most accurately translated in John 15, 27, where Jesus said, they hated me with Dorian without a cause. In other words, it means something that is given without any cause in the one who receives the gift. When they hated Jesus, it was without any cause whatsoever. They had no grounds to hate him. When God gives us his righteousness, it's without any cause in us. It's without any ground for deserving it whatsoever. We're declared as righteous as God is righteous as a completely free gift. And then it says, by his grace. This is the means that we're given. It's on the basis of a gift, but it's by the means of grace. You know, sometimes if you want some, some wonderful reading, buy the book, just, uh, it's just called by one word, Grace, by Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer. We'll have to order that book, Pat. Grace, by Lewis Sperry Chafer. The whole book is on, the great, on that one word, Grace, because grace is all that God set himself free to do for us through the death of Christ in our place. Grace means to receive something you can't ever deserve, and we're declared righteous by means of grace, which means we're declared righteous on a basis that we can never deserve it, that we can never earn it. And it's through the agency of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's another big word 
You know what the word redemption is? It's in the Greek, apolutrosis. Apolutrosis. This was a word that every Greek, every Roman, every citizen, every slave in the Roman Empire understood because it was a word from the slave market. It meant to purchase a slave out of the slave market and set him free by paying the ransom. And it says that's what Jesus has done for us. You know, the Bible has a complete teaching about this idea of redemption. The Bible says that the whole world is a slave market. The world system is a slave market. 1 John 5, 19, it says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, Satan. So it says that the world system that we live in here today is a slave market in slavery to Satan. The slave master is Satan himself. John 12, 31 tells us that. He is the prince of this world. He, he owns all that's in the world system. You see, when you become a believer, you're taken out of the world system. You still live here, but you're not part of the world system. You're taken out of it. The Bible says that all of us are born slaves. The human race is in slavery to sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It tells us that the problem is that we're slaves to sin. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. And it says there's only one way that we can be purchased out of this slave market, and that's by the highest bidder. And the highest bidder is Jesus himself. He's the Redeemer. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. The ransom price is the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, where it says, For, for as much as you know, you are not ransomed or redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold from your empty and vain manner of life handed down by religion from your forefathers, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There it shows the blood of Christ was the ransom price paid to purchase us out of the slave market of sin. Isn't it wonderful that God has purchased every person out of the slave market of sin and that you can receive that simply by faith, by believing that Jesus Christ died for you. The moment you do that, you are declared righteous as a gift without cause in you. On the basis of grace, you can never earn it. And that's why you can never lose it. If you're listening in on television right now, just simply bow your head and invite Jesus Christ to come into your life and thank him for dying for your sins. He will instantly come into your life and give you eternal life and forgiveness. He will bring you into a salvation that he maintains, and you can never lose it. What does the Bible teach? If you're declared righteous without any cause in you, and you're made as righteous as God is righteous, and you have been redeemed out of the slave market of sin by the payment of the ransom, the blood of Christ, and set free then how can you ever be lost again? You couldn't earn it in the first place. The minute you say that you're lost by your performance, what are you doing? You're saying that you're putting yourself back on the merit system. And if you try to keep your salvation by what you do, 
God says, fine, you're back on the merit system. You've fallen away from grace. Now, thank God that even then you don't lose your salvation, but you're certainly going to live a miserable life. And nothing you do is going to count for God. You know, a person who believes he can lose his salvation and therefore he is performing in order to keep it, you know what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ when he stands there? There's going to be a glorious bonfire. You know, I believe this is why God in Jesus Christ said, many that are first shall be last, and many that are last shall be first. You know why? Because there are a lot of people out there performing all kinds of things in the flesh. They talk about the Holy Spirit. They even pray to the Holy Spirit, and that's absolutely wrong. The Bible says we're to pray to the Father through Jesus Christ. We're not to pray to Jesus Christ. We're not to pray to the Holy Spirit. We're to pray to the Father through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit delights to be the unsung hero. He loves to do things behind the scenes. He came to glorify Christ, and that's when he's happy, when he's glorifying Christ and not himself. He doesn't want us to glorify him. He wants us to glorify Christ. Themselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. That he, the Son of Man, that is Jesus, is near.